young girl, my parents would share news with our family and friend by writing letters. They would uh, put in school pictures and uh, snapshots of sporting events along with a list of our latest achievements and they'd send that out to grandparents and aunts and uncles who lived in faraway cities. Nowadays people post to Facebook. They share little snippets of their lives by posting pictures and short comments. And then we respond to those by liking or by entering our own smart aleck little comments. Whether we're pulling photos out of our wallet or posting them to Facebook, what we are creating is a good news facade about who we are. We're creating our public face. Now in my circle of friends, I can't do it from up here. <laughs> in my circle of friends, there is one young man, and he always posts pictures showing off his mighty biceps and his huge shoulders. He wants us all to know that he's really strong. And another friend of mine, he, uh, it, it, what he posts is about his bike ride. He last said, nice 28 mile bike ride. Only one other member of my team was out tonight. And yet that was enough to make healthy competition. And so we were able to keep the pace over 16 miles per hour. This man wants you to know that he's still fun and fit. The other posting there is of a, one of my clergy friends. And this posting is a picture of her and her fiancé in a brand new shiny red and white plane. And her comment reads, So now I will be further distracted from wedding planning by planning trips to see faraway friends in our new plane instead. She is a bride and a plane owner. Each of these people has created a public image of themselves that belies the chaos in the rest of their life. That strong muscle builder, he cares so gently for his sister with Down's syndrome. And he's even taken on further parenting roles lately as his dad recovers from a devastating motorcycle accident. That man that was telling us how fast and how far he could ride, he's finally going back to full-time employment after a year of temporary part-time employment. And that young clergy friend who wanted to tell you about her fiancé and her plane, she's in her very first appointment, struggling with a congregation whose culture is so much different from her own. The truth is that our public image and our private chaotic lives are both reality. They're both inescapable and essential parts of who we are. And as such, they are subject to God's saving power and transformation, and they're useful in the kingdom of God. We can see this blend of all is well image and behind the scenes chaos in the scripture that tells of Solomon's ascension to the throne. Amy opened the lectionary readings today from 2 Kings with the words, David slept with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David. And Solomon sat on the throne of David, and his rule was firmly established. <coughs> and then she went on to read the next section and left out all the details of how that rule came to be firmly established. Solomon had his older stepbrother, Adoniah, killed because he was a political threat. And he had the priest. Abathathar removed from his clergy positions and sent to the outer posts of the kingdom 
to remove any religious threat. And then General Joab, David's general, who had at first aligned himself with the elder son, and why wouldn't he? He ran into the sanctuary and he hung on to the horns of the, of the um, ark and yet David's soldiers still came in and obeyed, so not David's soldiers, Solomon's soldiers still came in and obeyed the commandment to strike him dead, thus removing any threat from the military. So while we are presented with this all as well image of Solomon firmly established as a ruler, there's a chaotic and violent backstory. When we acknowledge this tension between public and private, and wisdom and weakness, and humility and hubris, and gifts already given and gifts yet to be gained, that's when we learn that we don't have to assume that we have to emulate everything that Solomon does uncritically. And we can see the mess that God has worked with in the lives of the biblical men and women. And it encourages us to look for God working in our messy lives. The second section that Amy read today described a dream in which Solomon wished for wisdom. Specifically, a discerning heart to govern God's people and distinguish between right and wrong. Solomon is just 20 years old. He's been promoted to a position that called for a level of maturity that he did not yet have. He's a young, inexperienced leader who sincerely wanted God guidance as he transitioned into this position. And just by recognizing that he needs help, he demonstrates good judgment. When we recognize our limitations, then we become open to new <coughs> possibilities, and it gives God something to work with. It must have been very comforting to receive a divine message in a dream at a time when he needed God's affirmation. At the same time, we can see from that same passage of scripture that Solomon's reign is not going to be without issues. Verse 3 began, Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the statues of his father David, <coughs> except that he worshipped in high places. He's supposed to be worshipping in Jerusalem, in the tent where the ark is. And, in, and, and this phrase, high places, it means mountaintops and hilltops where the Canaanites have built their sanctuaries to offer sacrifices to their gods. So Solomon has followed all of Torah except one of the most stringent rules in Deuteronomy, to worship where the Lord has commanded you to worship. And then his most fervent offering, this thousand sacrifices, thousand burnt offerings, is not made on the Lord's altar. In the same time, he receives a dream granting him a wise and discerning mind. It's interesting that immediately after he has this dream, does not wake up from the dream and say thanks to God there at that high place, <coughs> he returns to Jerusalem and offers a sacrifice before the ark. Throughout his life, Solomon makes mistakes as he struggles with worshiping God and worshiping the foreign gods of his many wives. Mistakes are inevitable. Poet James Joyce said that errors are the portals to discovery. Another anonymous writer said, 
They are stepping stones to success. Richard Bach, who wrote the 1970s bestseller, Jonathan Livingston Siegel, anybody old enough to have read that book? No? Wrote, there are no mistakes. The events that we bring on ourselves, no matter how unpleasant, are necessary in order to learn what we need to learn. Whatever steps we take, they're necessary to reach the places we've chosen. The places we've chosen. But I'd like to look at that same thought through a Christian lens. I would say that yes, through choice, we bring a lot on ourselves. Through our choices and the choices of others, sinful choices, we can be thrown right off course. <coughs> but it's not a journey that's necessary. It's not a necessary leg of the journey. Instead, it's a trip that we least want to do. It's not where God wants us to go. And yet God never leaves us, ever. Even in those dreadful places, God can still meet us, support us, love us, correct us, lead us to redemption, and forgive us. As flawed as the lives of David and Solomon were, they're also the apex of Israelite history. From that point on, generation after generation, king after king, struggled even more with disobedience and with unfaithfulness. <coughs> and yet God remained faithful and eventually sent to earth, not a king like David or Solomon who was wise some of the time, but wisdom incarnate. Jesus was a living, breathing, walking around example of all that is right in life. Theologian Walter Brueggemann suggests that wisdom is not just successful management or clever rulings or a flourishing economy or technological mastery. Rather, he says, it is an attentiveness to the socially and economically vulnerable. We need to learn to look after the poor. Thus the wisdom that Solomon did not learn is this attentiveness to those whom God has special attentiveness. There's no special age for learning this Christ-like wisdom. Lauren Hans, who's in our back pew there, lives next door in the Delmont Parsonage. And her, she and her family have been through a really chaotic time since their home burned. The family lost a great deal in that fire, and yet they've also been blessed by the generosity of the community. And as they began to rebuild, nine-year-old Lauren's thoughts turned to others who would also sometime suffer the loss of their home. And so she developed a charity called Lauren's Luggage. And she packs a suitcase with some of the essentials that families will need when they've been forced out of their home. And today, she's going to donate her first piece of luggage to the Rudra family, whose home burst, burnt last Sunday. And we first heard about the Hans family here in worship when Sharon lifted them up in prayer. And then Amy read the story online and alerted me, and I offered the parsonage to them. Amy had read about them in the Odington patch. And this week, the family was featured on the front page of the Maryland Gazette. And Lauren's launched her own Facebook site for Lauren's luggage. Lauren and the rest of the Hans family continued to struggle with the ongoing challenges of a messy human <coughs> life. But publicly, in the papers, and on Facebook, all is well. 
I see God working through both their suffering and their chaos and the calmer, more public image. God has been working to bring good from a horrible situation. And Lauren and her family have demonstrated that Christ-like wisdom by looking for a way to help others even when they themselves are still struggling. Through situations like this, I think that we can discern that both our public image and our chaotic personal lives are essential to who we are. And both can be part of God's saving grace and God's transformation, and both can be useful in the kingdom of God. Amen.